My name is Aaron Bushell. I am a serving member of the United States Air Force, and I'm about to engage in an extreme act of dark triad narcissism. Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. Now, today, I would like to explore the psychology of Mr. Aaron Bushell, who, on the 26th of February, set himself on fire uh, in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., and duly died. And I want to uh, demonstrate that he is not some kindly person, not some altruistic individual at all. He is exactly the kind of person that engages in martyrdom, and that is a person who is high in dark triad traits. Before we look at the evidence for this, please, please, please subscribe. It helps us violently if you do that. Subscribe here, and so most importantly, subscribe on jollyheretic.com, my substack, where there is all the spiciest content, uh, all of the stuff I wouldn't dare put on YouTube, in-person interviews, vlogs, all kinds of stuff, and where you can support, if you value what I do, do support my work for as little as a pint of beer a month. Now back to the video. So Aaron Bushell, why do people engage in martyrdom and what kind of people engage in martyrdom? What we might be taught to believe and what he would want us to believe is that he is a highly altruistic and kind person who has decided to make the ultimate sacrifice because he is so appalled that his country is engaged or is in some way supportive of this terrible war in Palestine. That's what he wants us to believe. And as you get older, of course, um, in general, it becomes clear that you shouldn't take people that engage in virtuous acts uh, or, or supposedly virtuous acts at face value. They don't do them uh, for the reasons that they say they do them. They do them for very different reasons indeed. Uh, if you look at the history of the kind of people, just all you have to do is read the history books of the kind of people who tend to engage in martyrdom, they don't come across as very nice people. They are generally extremely obstinate people. Uh, if you look, for example, at those that were burned at the stake for Protestantism under Queen Mary in England, it comes up again and again and again that the, the authorities don't particularly want to burn them at the stake. They don't want to martyr them. They don't want to kill them. They bend over backwards to try and persuade them to back down or to try and persuade them to affirm some form of words which they regard as theologically acceptable. And, in, and these people simply refuse to do so. And I've, I've looked at an example of that actually in my book, which is Feminism and the Fall of the West, of this particular individual um, who people were just begging. Um, uh, they were doing everything they could, the authorities, to try and not burn him. But he would not have it. And so as far as they were concerned, they were left with no choice. These are not kind, altruistic people at all. And this makes sense if we try to understand what it is that inspires martyrdom. What is the point of martyrdom? Well, um, on one level, it could be said that it inspires the group of which you are a part. So it, it inspires the group. It, it, it's, it's a show of strength to the group. So it's, it could be adaptive to have a, a certain small number within the population who are prepared to lay down their lives for the group uh, because uh, the group that has that optimum number of martyrs or self-sacrificial types is more likely to survive. Now, that obviously makes sense in terms of warfare as well. The kind of people who are prepared to take insane risks with their own lives in a, in a, in a situation of warfare, it is good for the society to have a small, optimum small number of those people. It inspires the group. The second point, perhaps, of martyrdom is it frightens the opponents. It's a way of saying to the opposing group, look how fanatical we are. Look how far we will go. You cannot make us frightened. We have no fear. We do not even fear death. We are prepared to die um, and, and we will keep going and we will keep going. It is a way of intimidating the outgroup. Now, at a more broadly evolutionary level, 
it is a way of passing on your genes. You can pass on your genes at the individual level by having children. You can pass on your genes at the kin level by, I don't know, investing in your nieces and nephews, that sort of thing. And you can pass on your genes at the group level because many studies have shown that two average English people are more genetically similar to each other than two, than the average English person and an average French person. And so you can extrapolate from this that sometimes it can be in the interests of an English person to lay down his life for his group to save his group, um, and therefore uh, he is indirectly passing on his genes. Now this raises the question of who are the kinds of people in a military context who are inclined to lay down their lives? What kinds of people are these? And these are not random, really, really kind people. These are people that are very low in fear to the extent that they do not fear death. These are people that are very impulsive to the extent that in the moment they will do something which most people would never do, which is impulsively act to, to lay down uh, their lives. Um, these are people, in other words, the, the kind of person that would act like that in, in a military situation has certain psychopathic traits. And it is good for the group that there are an optimum number of people, not too high, too high and you're in trouble. But too high and the group is, is, is not internally cooperative and it falls apart. But it is good for the group that those kinds of genes that would predict that behaviour stay in the group because it is good to have an optimum small number, basically, of these people that have psychopathic traits. That is to say, fearlessness, the ob absolute obstinacy in, in the face of the enemy, um, and also it's, it's good if those people are also highly motivated by the good of their group. And therefore both win. The group wins because these people are, are acting in such a way as to defend it, and the individual wins because he gets to pass on his genes indirectly. Now this raises the question of why on an individual level would a person uh, commit suicide? Now what they would want you to think is it's some form of pathological altruism. Um, that, that they are so concerned about a foreign group, about the Palestinians, that have nothing to do with them. Remember, this is a white American that have nothing to do with them. They are such a good moral person that they are going to lay down their lives. An alternate way of looking at it is that it is basically a misfiring of something which would be adaptive in other circumstances. So in most circumstances in our in our history, you are in a group where your group is telling you, you it's putting you on an adaptive roadmap of life and it's telling you to be concerned about your group and only your group um, and potentially even to lay down your life for that group. That's what your group is telling you. Now we are now in something of an evolutionary mismatch where our group is telling us, and remember we are adapted to do what our group tells us, our group is telling us no, that is not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to be concerned about groups other than your in-group and maybe even to lay down your life for them. Now in that context um, if you are, when you have been inculcated with those kinds of ideas, when you've been inculcated with the idea that status accrues by laying down your life for not your own group, but for some foreign group, or even if you just have, for some reason of being maladaptive, if, if, if you, you identify with the out-group to a greater extent than you do the in-group. And that's perfectly possible. And in fact, there's a study that is indicated by Waits et al., um, a study that's indicated that people that are right-wing, their moral circle is their in-group. It's people that are genetically close to them. They, they are at the centre and they care more about themselves and about their family, more about their family than their kin, their kin, their nation, their nation, their race, and so on. But with left-wing people, people, the, 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 the circle of, 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 of the moral circle is more distant from self to the extent that they will often care more about foreigners than they will about members of their own group. Now that's a good thing for them if you are left wing because it means if you are left wing you tend to be individualist, you tend to be a, a person that's right wing on average is, is, is concerned with the good of their group, group oriented values of obedience to authority and in group loyalty and whatever. A person's left wing tends to be concerned with harm avoidance and equality. And that means that um, you, you, you're concerned with your, your individually oriented values, the good of yourself. It's a way of getting to the top of the group. 
And one way you can get to the top of the group is by collaborating with foreigners um, <coughs> against the interests of your in-group so that you can get to the top of your own group. So it would make sense for such people to actually be attracted to foreigners and to identify with foreigners. So you have then two things. One is that the, the their, their social group is telling them that it's good to be more concerned about foreigners than their, their, their own group. Two, they may well be more concerned about foreigners than their own group. And then three, they tend to have a desire for power. Remember, they're individually oriented. Now then we get to a point where you have a misfiring of a desire for power. Your desire for power, and we all as humans should desire power to some extent because it is those in prehistory that have the power uh, that are able to pass on their genes. The desire for power can misfire such that you desire it so strongly that you are prepared to lay down your life in pursuit of it i.e. it gives you to, 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 to make the sacrifice that he's made will on his, for, according to his thinking will give him some status within the group a uh, very high status within the group now and, and therefore he will lay down his life even though it costs him his life his desire for power um, is so strong that it outweighs even the desire for life itself so it's a misfiring or it's an extreme desire for power Machiavellianism another thing it can be seen as is a desire for praise. Again, we all desire praise. It's the people that are praised to get to the top of the group. It's the people that are praised that are more likely to pass on their genes. It's praise makes us feel secure and happy. You can have a desire for praise that is so strong, so potent that it, and it misfires. It's, it's, it's abnormally strong and therefore you lay down your life in pursuit of that desire for praise. And finally, you can have anger, overwhelming anger. There are adaptive things about anger, but there, but if it's, if it's maladaptive, then you want to express that anger, express that fury, upset people, make people feel unhappy, and you can want that to such an extent that it overwhelms even your desire for life. So what you have, it's, a, it's not a particularly adaptive this, but it, you, what you have is a, at the individual level, maybe adaptive at the group level, to have a small number of such people, is a pathological, anger, pathological des uh, desire for praise, that is to say narcissism, <clears throat> and pathological desire for power, that is to say Machiavellianism, and this means uh, that you can see that such people would end up laying down their lives in the manner in which this person has. Now, if you if you say so what we're seeing so far is that the kind of people that engage in martyrdom in general aren't very pleasant people. The kind of people, the, the kind of motivations, the way that you can make sense of martyrdom at the individual level is that you have traits basically of dark triad, of narcissism, that is that you strongly desire praise and for people to love you and, uh, and uh, you know, think you're great, grandiosity, that sort of thing, um, and Machiavellianism, that you strongly desire power and that sort of thing. So you can, you can see how um, we might suspect that that would be the kind of, uh, the kind of psychology of individual martyrs. Now if we then look at the psychology of the kind of people that actually do kill themselves then it starts to this starts to make uh, even further sense. One of the conditions which is associated with suicide, indeed 10% of people that have this condition kill themselves and 70% of people that have it try to kill themselves and 84% of people that have it self-harm is borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is marked by a fundamental fear of abandonment. This means that you do not develop a secure sense of who you are and what you are. Most people develop a secure sense of them, a, a, a sort of monitor of self that ultimately controls their emotions and, and is stable across time and controls who you are and controls how emotional you get. A super ego, if you like, a, a, a controlling uh, force um, that says ultimately that everything's going to be okay, the world is ultimately a, a reasonably good place, the world is logical and consistent, the world can be trusted, the world is kind, the world is good. These people lack that. They have a fundamental fear of abandonment. They are constantly frightened that they will be abandoned. Um, and they have very extreme emotions and very strong emotional dysregulation. They, they don't have that person at their core. They don't have a core that can control their emotions. So they can swing wildly and very quickly between different extreme of, extremes of emotion. And they ultimately have um, extremely negative 
feelings about themselves. Uh, they feel that they are no good. Well, they feel that in, in some ways they feel they are very good. They feel that they are um, a, a good person. Uh, but then they they are confronted with all these terrible aspects of themselves that they can't control themselves and they can't control their emotions and they can't control what they do. And so therefore they feel on that level that they are a very bad person. And they have to deal with, they experience the world as, as this intense, frightening place where they constantly fear being abandoned and they also constantly fear um, uh, being being dominated by people and being being overwhelmed. So they fear on the one hand being abandoned in a relationship, but they fear on the other hand being engulfed by a relationship such that they can't control themselves and don't know who they are anymore and don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and, and that they're too they're too they're too uh, uh, under the control of and uh, and too reliant on somebody else who might abandon them. And so therefore you get this oscillation all the time between abandonment, and engulfment, abandonment, engulfment. So they're very very unhappy people ultimately. And so they negotiate life by creating a fantasy. Now, one fantasy that they create is narcissism, is what's called vulnerable narcissism. This is that they tell themselves as much as they can, that they are perfect, that they are wonderful, that they are brilliant, that they are special, that they are all these kind of things. They don't really feel it, and so a, a, a lot of the time they will, they will, they, if, if the slightest thing happens which pricks this, then 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 they will uh, they will be back to the scared little person. They will be concerned. They will be overwhelmed and by their negative emotions, and to the extent they'll want to kill themselves. And so you get a kind of narcissistic rage in response to those that are, that, are, that question the things which make them feel that they are important and that they are perfect um, uh, to, to just get that person to go away because this, the concern is if they don't then their narcissistic mask will slip and they will be revealed for what they are which is this person that has no sense of core and, and is just worth it will be overwhelmed by negative feelings and may kill themselves so that's narciss that's borderline personality disorder but disorder and as um, as you would expect people that are high in narcissism particularly in vulnerable narcissism have a high suicide rate and so you can see and and this is one of the reasons why narcissism itself is associated with a high suicide rate because narcissism is this mechanism of, of covering up um, a, a person who is fundamentally capable of huge emotional dysregulation up to the extent that they will want to kill themselves. Um, so that's the, that's one reason. Narcissists are more likely to kill themselves, particularly vulnerable narcissists via the false sense of self. The second uh, disorder, or uh, uh, which, which which predicts uh, wanting to kill yourself, um, is psychopathology. Now, psychopathology, primary psychopathology, that's what you typically understand to be a psychopath. This is when you are callous uh, and you are fearless and you have no empathy and that kind of thing. That's primary psychopathology. So, primary psychopathology means you're fearless, and this will include meaning that you're fearless of death itself. Now, secondary psychopathology is slightly different. This is that you have a parasitic lifestyle, that you have no direction in life, that you con people, and also that you are highly emotionally dysregulated. This means that you feel negative feelings very strongly, which, of course, crosses over into neuroticism and depression and things like that. Now, those two, two sets of traits will, to some extent, correlate. So if you have both, if you have both psychopathology, primary psychopathology, then you are able to commit suicide. If you have secondary psychopathology, then you may well want to commit suicide. And so the result is that you do commit suicide. Similarly, they're called the dark triad traits because they go together. So some often narcissism will go together with psychopathology. Now, obviously, if you have uh, narcissistic traits, um, this will mean that you can you will develop perhaps a martyr complex, an idea that you're extremely special, that you've been chosen by God, that you're wonderful, all of that sort of thing, that you're quite you're 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 quite amazing. But if this and if this can go together with psychopathology, meaning you also won't fear death, and this can further go together with secondary psychopathology, meaning that you can become highly emotionally dysregulated, meaning that actually. Um, you know, you may, you may well want to die at certain points, because, uh, on, on some level anyway, because you because you know that it, you, you're all fake and whatever. And this and this can come together as being a martyr. Um, and as we already saw, there is a degree to which if you are high in Machiavellianism, uh, i.e., you're power hungry, well, you'll get you know, you'll be empowered in some way. You'll have status by being a martyr at least in some kind of community. Um, and so therefore, if that again goes together with psychopathology, or if that goes together with vulnerable narcissism, then um, you can, well, certainly with psychopathology, then you can see how you create a person who will set themselves on fire like he did. Now, one thing that is noticeable if you watch the video is I think he thought they'd put the fire out. I, so I, I think this, is, this, was not a, this was just self-harming. 
this wasn't he I don't think he was even a martyr I think he did this this act people that self-harm women it's mainly that self-harm they are high in psychopathic traits which means that uh, they, they are highly emotionally dysregulated and the self-harming regulates their emotion it gives it gives them some drama it gives them something that, 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 that allows them to ignore all the terrible things they're thinking about themselves it allows them a feeling of control it 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 it, it lessens their intense negative emotions self-harming so that, that's why they do that um but also um there's a degree to which the way in which he was self-harming harming, i.e. by setting himself on fire for a political cause, um, gives him status and therefore makes him feel better, uh, gives him narcissistic supply and therefore makes him feel better. And so you, know, you can see that that's ultimately why he did it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, he was given a little bit too much narcissistic supply and he was allowed to burn himself to death. So, so, so again, you can see now, you can see now why it is that uh, certain we need martyrdom in a group, why they are likely to do it, and how this crosses over at the individual level with the kind of people that do kill themselves, which is very similar psychologically to the kind of people we would expect to martyr themselves, i.e., those that are obsessed with power, uh, those that are obsessed with praise, and those that are highly emotionally dysregulated and feel negative emotions very strongly. Now, if we look at Aaron Bushell himself, well, first of all, he's twenty-five. Are you ready for the future of the West?